The next printer that I'm going to get through as I'm working through my March Madness is the Geetech E180, the printer that I thought might, when I looked at the specs of it, might dethrone the Monoprice Select Mini as my recommended starter printer of choice for people. But before we talk about that, let's talk about what this printer and the family of printers that it's a part of means for 3D printing in general. When I entered 3D printing, it was right after what I would consider the first wave of home 3D printing enthusiasts. That first wave had to be like 90% engineer at least. You had to be able to source your own parts and, and build your own 3D printer and fix the problems and write your own firmware and do all those things because there weren't many people ahead of you. Well, there was the RepRap project and, and they were building cool things, but they were doing it together and they still had a lot of problems to solve. And when I got in, it was in maybe the second wave when there were kits and stuff that you could build. In fact, my first 3D printer, the Replicator 1, was to my knowledge, the first fully assembled 3D printer that you could buy without having to build a kit yourself. And that was super exciting because it meant that you had to be less engineer and could be more artist. And that's kind of where I'm at. Personally, I consider myself like 50-50 artist and engineer. So yeah, I got in at that point. And during that point though, we, we could all still see that there was advantages to bringing 3D printers to the home space. And that 3D printers, while ostensibly an industrial manufacturing machine, had advantages over every other industrial manufacturing machine. Unlike a laser cutter, they don't have all the accoutrements that go along with it. Unlike a CNC cutter, they're not so huge that you can't bring them into the house or into a, a home space at any rate. And so we could kind of foresee a future where 3D printers would become ubiquitous, where 3D printers would become appliances, and that you would have them in almost every house. However, in the five years or more that I've been a part of 3D printing, we haven't seen much progress towards that end, towards the appliance of 3D printing. And now I feel like we're starting to see some printers that are. However, it's like the uncanny valley. The closer you get to that goal, the more closely you get scrutinized, the harder it gets to actually hit it. And it doesn't help that some of these printers, uh, in order to cut costs, are making them their printers less good than some of these other printers. I feel like they're they're trying to take a step back as a prep for a run up a, as a, a hundred yard dash to this to this great goal. And yet, because of the step backs that they took, their run-up ends up being them falling flat on their face. Now, that's not to say that I don't think that these printers are important. They are very important. And it's very important to me that one of these printers somehow get it right. And we have seen some steps made recently to try and make that happen. For instance, the Neva is they just up released a firmware that addressed some of my concerns in the Neva review, and it's a much better printer now because of it. It still isn't perfect, but it's getting better, and so I'm happy to see that at least Neva hasn't stopped. Also, the JG Aurora A5, I, I managed to crack it open, and I will talk about that later, but it, it might be better than I initially said. However, yeah, it's going to be a difficult journey to find that 3D printer that will make it happen. Seeing these printers get, seeing these printers try and fail hurts me a little bit. Not hurts me, but I worry. I worry for 3D printing. I worry that the failure or at least lack of success of these 3D printers are going to discourage other people from trying to meet this goal, this goal that I really, really want to see somebody meet. I want to have a 3D printer that I could recommend to 
everybody. I want to have a 3D printer that is as easy to use as a microwave, that is as easy to use as a 2D printer, that you're sitting there online looking at a picture of something in 3D or a, not a picture obviously, but a 3D model and you go, ooh, I wanna print that. And you say, print in 3D and boom, your printer springs to life and just does it. And where we don't have to worry about nozzle jams because if it jams, it'll somehow fix itself or detect it and walk you through the fixing of it. And that we can just load filament in as easy as we load an ink cartridge in an inkjet printer. I want to see that be a reality. So now that we've discussed what uh, all of that, let's discuss this printer in general. The Geetech E180, when I unboxed it, you saw me unboxing this at the end of my uh, Defensive Gear Best video, which if you haven't watched, uh, you, don't, you don't have to watch that one. It's okay. It's fine. I was started to unbox this, and as I unboxed this, I, I was actually kind of impressed with it. It had in it a, uh, a instruction sheet to guide you through, and I like that. I like when we get a piece of paper to walk you through the first steps. It had a rather interesting sort of filament spool holder. It's just a couple of pieces of metal put together. There's no friction reduction on here. And I've, I've used this for spools and it really kind of tears up the inside of the spools. And then it comes with a very generous uh, sample of filament to do some sample prints with. That is, uh, while I'm excited to see Richard Horn's master spool becoming a thing from the supply side, I don't think this was the future he envisioned. This needs a little bit of work as you're printing. You gotta make sure that you keep unrolling it. I am gonna print out a master spool and see how it works for that. Although the master spool doesn't print on a mini printer. And then I got the printer out, started to look at it. And the first thing I noticed on this printer was something that wasn't in the specs. See, whether or not they have a heated build plate is something you kinda gotta pay attention for because either they'll say that they have a heated build plate or they won't. They don't ever say no heated build plate. They just quietly don't say anything about a heated build plate. And sure enough, I could tell really easily there's no wires going into this build plate. It is not heated. Oh, darn it. I mean, that's that's okay, but to me, a heated build plate is kind of a big, uh, big deal. And you can go see my Neva review, read the comments, uh, the, the write-up that I did for that one in the comment section. Yeah, one day maybe I'll make a video about why heated build plates are important to me, but for now the notes are there. It's important to me. And it was a big minus to this printer that it didn't have one. Still, I wanted to give it a shot. Fired it up. Cool, full color touchscreen interface. Happy to see that. That is exciting. Really easy to use. Really functional, actually. It has auto bed leveling. No, it has assisted bed leveling. And it's actually a very familiar menu. In fact, the entire menu seems a little bit different, but fairly familiar. This, this is the exact same touchscreen menu as on the JG Aurora A5. What does that mean? Who is making these touchscreens and selling it to DTEC and JG Aurora to build, put on these 3D printers? And does that mean that someday, possibly someday soon, we will see a 3D printer that's got it all together and the touchscreen interface that I like? I hope so. So go through the auto leveling. Now, I complained about the assisted leveling on the A5 because it doesn't walk you through the process. You kind of have to know what you're doing and use the interface wisely. It's even worse with this printer because this printer, it, it's different than most 3D printers. It puts its ZN stop on the top, the limit switch for it. So it only knows when to stop moving the Z when it goes to the top. Now that's actually a good way to do it because it means that they can go as low as they want uh, until it hits the build plate. So if you tighten up these screws just a little bit tighter, you can actually bring your build plate down just a little bit, which raises your effective area. It also means that if you ever get a heated build plate and it means that you're losing a little bit of space on the bottom, you don't have to move the end switch. You just have to re-level the plate. But it also means that you have to tell it where the plate is. And if you don't know to do it, then you're going to screw up the leveling process. So the way you level this printer is you manually move the Z down in the middle until it touches the build plate, and then you hit OK to set the Z. And that is the 
only time you do that. Then you move it to each one of the corners and you adjust the screws. If you don't realize that that's the process and they don't write that down very well in the, in the sheet of paper that they give you, you're going to screw it up a couple of times. And I screwed it up a couple of times until I figured it out. But once I figured it out, we got a nice level. We're good to go. Okay, fine. I start trying to print and I start trying to heat the nozzle and it's not heating. Actually, it did heat the first time and I got it loaded. And then when I tried to print, it never heated the nozzle. It kept reading at zero. Somewhere the thermistor on it was broken. And that was weird. Fortunately, this 3D printer ships with a new nozzle, and if this nozzle looks a little bit bigger and more complicated than the nozzles you're used to, that's because it is. It's more than just a nozzle. It's got all the electronics in it. And so, okay, fine, I'll just swap out the nozzle. How do I swap out the nozzle? Now, I ran into a problem where the feed got jammed because the nozzle wasn't heating up and it kept stripping the filament. So I had to go into the back and take off the pretty cover that they had uh, over the feed mechanism so I could get at that. And that wasn't a problem. And there was another pretty cover around the extruder mechanism. And so I removed that and unthreaded it from the whole thing and took it off so that I could get at it. And I'm trying to figure out how to put this nozzle in. So I start, you know, doing what you do. I start unscrewing screws. And then I discover after I had unscrewed two screws that were very hard to put back in and uh, I never did get one of them back in, that there's a little switch on the bottom that all you have to do is pull the switch and then that nozzle pulls right out. Well, darn. I wish I'd have known that before I took this whole thing apart, but Yitek did not do a very good job of explaining any of this. So I swap in the new nozzle, and lo and behold, it starts heating up. So the old nozzle has got something wrong with its thermistor, I guess. Then I start running the print, and I'm, I'm doing the test print, which I've looked at the G-code in Simplify 3D, and it's a doggy! Cool! So I start printing the doggy, and it gets part way through that print, and all of a sudden, that nozzle starts reading at zero as well. What's going on? Uh, it jams again because it, it can't feed any filament through. The little, little misdirection. This was the one that jammed the second time. This was the one that jammed the first. But they're both not reading anything on the filament. They're reading zero. Despite the fact that they're, they've got a target of 200, it's always reading 0 of 200, and it's popping up saying, error, 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 I can't read it. I don't know whether the problem with this one is in the software. I don't know whether the problem with this one is in the hardware. I don't know how to fix this problem. And because everything is encased in some solid plastic without a single screw to take this thing apart, I'm once again barred from fixing this thing. I'm, I'm basically locked off. I can try and take these plastic covers off. Oh, by the way, the whole thing is plastic instead of metal like the Monoprice Select Mini, which I'm not opposed to. It makes for an overall lighter 3D printer, and that's not a bad thing. But uh, yeah, I, I could try and get at the electronics of this thing, but if the problem is in these nozzles, how many of these nozzles am I going to have to go through? Or if the problem is in one of these connectors leading up to the nozzle, I don't know. And just like with JG Aurora's A5, I have no recourse for sending this back to the manufacturer or sending it to a local place to get it fixed and repaired and, and have them send me one that actually works. This is, as a consumer, you're a little bit stuck. Now, uh, it's possible Geetech might still contact me and we could get it to work. In fact, this is not necessarily the end of this story. I got a second one of these. Some shipping error happened and, and they sent me two of them, which means I guess I've got one for spare parts and the other one might work. I don't know. I don't know if I even want to unbox this one because in the end, it's a fancy printer with a great user interface, but no heated build plate, which again is a big deal to me. Still, you know, again, this, this, I might get this up and running and then donate it to a library or something like that. I'm sure somebody could use this 3D printer. So it, it, it in the end might be a good thing and I'm glad I've got the second one. Otherwise, I, I don't even know where to start. Ugh, put that away. 
where to start on fixing this one and getting it up and running. I'm gonna contact E-Tech. I'm gonna see if maybe I can get this resolved. But overall, okay, so do I recommend this 3D printer? You could probably already tell how I feel about it. If they had a heated build plate on here, honestly, if they had just put a heated build plate on this thing and not raised the price significantly after doing so, I might be willing to recommend this printer because a heated build plate means that much to me. E even as, you know, shoddy as it is, if I can get this fixed and it, they get put in a heated build plate, yes, definitely, I would recommend it. But as it is, no heated build plate, big minus, and no ability to fix it when it breaks, big minus. I, I hate reporting like this again. Now, I, I will say I've got another report about the JG Aurora A5. I managed to crack it open and I got it fixed. So there will be a future video where I will go back and say, you know, I might actually recommend the JG Aurora A5. Uh, but this one, I don't know if there's any redemption for this one. I feel bad saying that, I really do, but you know, it hurts less saying it the second time than it did the first time. I guess I'm getting used to this. Oh well, there we are again. Uh, I, I appreciate you guys sticking with me through March Mad Mess as I clean this place up and go through these printers. I don't know what I'm going to do with this thing. Give me some ideas in the comments of what you think I should do with it. I thank you guys very much for watching and, and letting me ramble on about the importance of this and that and 3D printing. If you want to know more about it, of course, hit the blog. I've got some more comments in the comment section. I've got some more to say about it. Link to the blog there. So go check that out. But as always, I want to thank you very much for watching. I want to thank my Patreon backers. Your support means more to me than ever right now. And you guys are, are keeping me afloat. So thank you. Remember, safety first. See you next time. Do you want to know more about 3D printing but don't know where to start? Or did you buy a 3D printer but you need some help getting it going? Don't panic. The Beginner's Guide to the 3D Printing Galaxy is here, now, for you. Buy it on Amazon.